Well, good morning again. Um, first of all, I want to say that uh, Ann and I had a great time last night. She told me to be sure to tell you all how much she enjoyed the food and the fellowship and the, the games and everything. She really had a, a good time. Uh, open your Bibles, please, to 1 Kings chapter 18. It's on page 340 in your pew Bible, the black pew Bible. 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, the, the surprise in this is like the title and what I'm trying to link it together to. Uh, I've been thinking about this a while, and to me it makes perfect sense. What we're going to read and study and think about today is uh, a great contest between the prophet Elijah and King Ahab and his prophets of Baal. So I'm calling this the Old Testament Super Bowl, and I waited until today to put it to present it to y'all, I'm not trying to be silly. I just, I have these lot of things, ideas bouncing around in my mind. That may be a sign of mental illness, but I think it's, uh, it kind of goes well with this, this what's happening today. Let me present the context to you. Elijah is a great prophet. If you were raised in church, you've heard about him. You've heard the stories. You've had Bible studies. And Sunday, uh, VB, I remember VBS lessons on this, uh, how, how his life ended and everything. And, but anyway, um, he's introduced in the previous chapter, chapter 17. And his story continues in the Old Testament through 2 Kings chapter 2. But his name is mentioned 28 times in the New Testament. You know, and you stop thinking about it, that's a lot of ink and paper for someone who was absolutely a prophet but does not have a separate book in the Bible with his name as the title. So he, he, is a, he was, had a powerful ministry that teaches us a lot of lessons. Some amazing things happened in his lifetime. And the, the context we will look at today is this. King Ahab is on the throne in the northern kingdom of Israel, and his capital city is called Samaria. Remember, this is the time when... Uh, after the death of King Solomon, there was a civil war. Uh, you had two nations. You had the northern kingdom called Israel with a capital city called Samaria. The southern kingdom is called Judah, and their capital city is Jerusalem. So Ahab is on the throne, and like most kings, he was an evil king. Um, and his, but his especially evil queen Jezebel is universally recognized, if you read all her story, as the most evil woman in the, uh, almost in the whole Bible. She was just that bad and evil and hated God, hated the religion of most of her people. Uh, uh, Elijah had been, as a prophet of God, called to preach some particular types of sermons he had been preaching sermons calling for the repentance of all the people in Israel, starting at the top with Ahab and Jezebel. Now, Ahab tolerated this because as evil as he was, he still had a, a minimal level of respect for prophets. But uh, Jezebel, on the other hand, was just seething with hatred. Uh, and wanted Elijah's head on a pole that she could put on the palace walls. So um, they're, they're evil, and, and uh, uh, Elijah's preaching against them. And I thought it's interesting. He preaches more toward, uh, he preaches to the, te to the people, but he really goes more toward Ahab and Jezebel. There's a principle in there. As goes the leadership of a country, of a state, of a, of a community, so goes the morality of the people whom they are leading. Stop and think about that. That's why later in one of Paul's letters, he says to pray for people, all in a, people in authority. And he names levels of people of authority. So I think, A, I mean, uh, Ezekiel is modeling that in his, in his ministry. He's preaching to the people, but he's pointing to Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab has become, by this time, a, um, um, 
a, a follower of the Baal religion and the prophets, Jezebel has a, a, another uh, false god that she uh, gives acknowledgement and allegiance to. And, and Ezekiel is simply saying, I mean, Elijah is simply saying, you two need to repent. If you repent, the people will repent. Well, Jezebel especially does not appreciate being called out by name. Can you imagine going on, uh, on national television and start, start calling out people by name, not because you so much dis, dis, you disagree with their political policies, but you're calling them out to repent of their religious beliefs and their moral practices. That's what's going on. So let's read chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Um, oh, let me back up by saying one of the things God has told uh, Elijah to do, he says, go to Ahab. This is kind of like Ahab's last chance and tell him, God is going to withhold all the rain from this country, basically until you repent. But basically it says, God has told me it will not start raining until I, Elijah, say so. God is stopping the rain, but he's giving me the authority to say when it starts back up. So let's look at 18, uh, chapter 1, uh, chapter 18, verse 1. After a long time in the third year, third year of what? The drought. Three years, can you imagine what three years of absolute drought in Middle Tennessee would do to us? In the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab. I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah. Now this is not the Obadiah who the book is named after. This is a different one. Ahab had summoned Obadiah who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. Now that's interesting. Ahab, we painted the picture of him, but even in Ahab's palace, in the lines of power influence that emanate from the throne, there is still one strong believer who has managed to maintain his position. I, I contend from just what I know about uh, reading what's going on in our national political structure and our state political structures, in every level of authority in this country, the person at the top may be a pagan, but all throughout their administrations are people of faith. That's, that's another group of people do you realize we need to be praying for, the Christians who are in uh, the presidential administration. The Christians who are maybe not be senators and congressmen, but they're on the staffs. They have influence. They have an, uh, they can get the ear of the person in power. So that's a, something that just pops out at me right there. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord, and while Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, now remember, Ahab tolerated prophets. Jezebel hated them. It's like she had a little network of spies. Go out and find out who these people are. They're talking against me and the king and kill them. Just, just, just give them. So that's where, that was her joy of the day. If somebody came and reported, oh, we found five more prophets today and we killed them. Uh, continuing in verse 4, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two, two caves. That's called civil disobedience that will get you killed. So he's not only a man of faith in the Lord, he's a brave believer. He could get really, I mean, he could get killed. So he had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, 50 in each cave, and had supplied them with food and water. So where did he get food and water? We're not told, but obviously God was providing a faithful Obadiah with enough food and water to keep the faithful prophets alive through a drought, and through a persecution. That's an important principle. Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land they were to cover, Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in the other. Verse 7, 
as Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him, bowed to the ground and said, Is it really you, my lord Elijah? Yes, he replied. Go and tell your master, Elijah is here. Boy, that was setting up a confrontation, don't you imagine? So, uh, that's, that's where we are right now. There's, I, there's a lot of material, but I want to skip down to verse 16 and pick up again there. So Obadiah went to Ahab and told him, Ahab, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, meaning when Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. So uh, when he says, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And that shows now you've got Ahab following the Baal, the, the god Baal, Jezebel following Asherah, another false god, and Ahab is saying, all right, it's time for a showdown. Uh, Ahab, you go get your 450 prophets, have them come to Mount Carmel, tell that evil wife of yours, the evil stinking wife, to bring her prophets of Asherah and have her also come to Mount Carmel. So uh, Ahab sent word through all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. A Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow, follow him. Interesting thing here, as we go and read the story, guess who didn't show up for the showdown? Jezebel and who? Her 400 prophets of Asherah. Now, there were 450 prophets of Baal, 400 of them showed up. And word got out across the country, this is going to be the biggest thing that's happened in our lifetimes. There's going to be a showdown between, uh, and they weren't really sure what was going to happen. They knew it was going to be entertaining, if nothing else. Uh, Elijah and whoever shows up to support him. And Baal uh, and, and Ahab with his 400 prophets showed up. And before anything starts, Ahab speaks to the people. You have seen who has gathered here. Ahab and his prophets. You have seen who has not gathered here. That evil queen Jezebel and her prophets. But God is shown up. You just can't tell yet. But by the time the day is over, I want you to make the most important decision in your life. If the Lord God is God, you make your decision to follow him and no one else. But if Baal ends up today on top, well, then you're free to follow him too. So now begins the kickoff of what I'm calling the Old Testament Super Bowl as it is recounted in verses 22 through 27. So let's look at that. Then, the, then Elijah uh, said to them, I am the only one of Lord's prophets left. That says something about uh, Elijah. He didn't realize, he didn't find out till later that he wasn't the only one. But why did he say that? I think that Elijah was depressed. Do you get depressed every night as a believer? Sometimes you see things going on in your life, in your family, in your community, in your country. You're going, God, why are you letting this happen? I've been told all my life that you are faithful, that you are good, that you reward those who seek you and follow Jesus. Why do I not see with my eyes that happening? I think Elijah was a little depressed and maybe a little scared because he's there by himself, basically. Uh, verse 22, but Elijah said to them, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Go get two bulls for us. 
Let them choose, let them, meaning the Baal prophets, choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire is the real God. He is God. So this is an amazing thing. He's announcing to the people. Everybody's wondering, we've been called here. Is something big going to happen? They're calling it a showdown. And now they know. Elijah, inspired by God, commanded by God, has said, you get the firewood, you build your, your uh, altar, you cut up your bull, you put it on there, and we'll do mine, and we'll see. God's not going to, whoever's the right God, Baal or the Lord, are not going to like both of them, and we're going to see today, we're going to settle this matter, who is the real God you should worship and obey. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Verse 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Uh, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. They were convinced if they did everything right, if they prepared the wood, if they cut up the bull and put him on there and called on Baal, He'd come down just like that and prove to Elijah and Ahab and everybody else that Baal is the one true God, and it wasn't happening. At noon, verse 27, Elijah began to taunt them, as my translation says it. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. Y'all know that sometimes I like to chase a rabbit in the middle of a sermon? Here's one of the best ones I've ever come across. In verse 21 in the New International Version, the NIV uses the word busy. It says, uh, uh, Elijah says, perhaps your God is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Uh, other translations give some very widely different uh, choices of words from the ancient Hebrew. Apparently that word in Hebrew that my Bible translates as busy is an extremely difficult word to translate. Now remember this, this particular Hebrew, this is like 2,500, almost 3,000 years old. At its base though, most scholars believe it has something to do with, with not the meaning of move or a moving. Some English translations are more willing to be honest as to the possible meaning of that Hebrew word than other. While the NIV uses the word busy, the King James Version, our pew Bibles, which was translated over 400 years ago while using Hebrew documents that were not as old and accurate as the ones we have now, they use the word pursuing. NIV says busy, King James says pursuing. The New American Standard, which is widely considered the most accurate English translation in existence right now, uses the phrase, gone aside. Busy, um, uh, pursuing, gone aside. Well, gone aside to do what? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Keep that, in, in, that question in mind. The New Living Translation says, relieving himself. And the older living Bible, which is a paraphrase, not a direct translation, just plainly says, your God is sitting on the toilet. This is one of the reasons I love the Old Testament. It's very earthy and real in how it tells stories. Think about what Elijah is saying in context of the Super Bowl. When that game starts tonight, and, you know, right in the middle of the third or fourth quarter when things are starting to go bad for one team maybe or tension is building, what do these players do on the field when they're, when they're talking to each other? What do we call it? Taunting? What's another phrase? Trash talk. 
what Elijah is doing here, he is trash talking the prophets of Baal. Now we have to ask ourselves, well, why is there such disparity of differences in the translation of that Hebrew word from the different English translations? It's really quite simple. The guys who translated the King James, they did the best job they had with the documents that they had, but they realized that this Bible was going to be read in public in the presence of women and children. And these guys were going to be known who did the translations. And they were all educated scholars at Oxford and Cambridge University, leaders in the Anglican Church. And what they said, we can't say what we think most likely this is going. No, let's just say that uh, King James says it is, uh, he's pursuing, he's pursuing something. Same thing with the newer translations, the new American series. Every translation that has come out for the last 50 years especially, uh, there'll be a list in, the, in your Bible usually of who did the translating. And you'll read their names of pro, profoundly uh, well-known theology professors and, and leaders of denominations. And they're thinking, this is going to be read in public from the, from the pulpit. They're going to have Bible studies where we've got to read this. We can't, it really, was it, would it really be appropriate to say what we really, really think? Well, only two translations did. They're saying uh, when you go aside, you're going aside to go to the bathroom. And so Elijah here is just throwing gasoline on the fire that hasn't even occurred yet. And he's saying, what's wrong with your God Baal? Where is he? He said, is he deep in thought somewhere? Is he pondering this question, trying to decide what to do? Is he on the toilet going to the bathroom relieving himself? Uh, or is he asleep? I and mean, he is driving them nuts. Let's do verse 28 through 39 now. Uh, verse 28. So they, meaning the prophets of Baal, shouted louder, and they slashed themselves with swords and spears, uh, that was their custom, until the blood flowed. They're not exact. That was That's really a... a a practice among a lot of pagan religions. If you want to show your God how much you love him or her and are devoted to him or her and you're praying and you're not getting your answers, well, pull out a knife and just start cutting you. My blood is flowing out of my love and devotion for you. Please answer this prayer, especially since we've got thousands of people around watching us. Uh, verse 29. Midday pass, and they continue their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Baal, if he existed, was silent. Verse 30, then Elijah said to the people, come here to me. They've had, they've had hours now to do what, what we've asked them to do. Now come over here and help me. So they came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord. Do you realize what's happened? Mount, if you go back and you read the preceding part of the Old Testament, Mount Carmel had for centuries by this time been one of the places that the Hebrew people went to worship God. They had an altar that, that they built to offer sacrifices and to pray. Remember, they didn't, the tabernacle stones back up made it look good and everything. <clears throat> and... Uh, so, uh, verse 31, Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes de descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar. He, he rebuilt that altar that was there, you might say. Uh, in the name of the Lord, he dug a trench around it with that was large enough to hold two seas of sea. That was a big, deep, wide trench around the altar. Then he arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. And to which the people went, Huh? <laughs> what? What did you say? Yeah, get the water. Go down and get the water from that stream down there in the jars. Pour it on the, the cut pieces of the bull and on the wood. And they're going, Sorry, buddy, but that ain't going to light. 
They did it anyway. Verse 34, do it again, he said. So they can get more water, dumping water on the wood and the bull. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. And he's praying in a loud voice. He wants Ahab to hear him. He wants the failed prophets of Baal to hear him. But more importantly, he wants all the people who've gathered close to hear him as he prays. So I suspect Elijah has a booming, clear voice. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you, that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The Super Bowl has just ended, and the score is one against zero. So, why am I comparing this story to the Super Bowl? And here's, if you'll allow me to stretch this a little further, I'll do it like this. The two best teams in the land have faced off. The 400 prophets, uh, 450 prophets of Baal and Elijah, the prophet God. So the odds are 400 to 1 that uh, Baal is going to win this Super Bowl. Well, that doesn't seem very fair. That, you know, you're serving God uh, and you're standing up and you're trying to live your life on the job and your family and your neighborhood and you feel outnumbered, don't you? I do. So we all do sometimes. Well, guess what? God loves those odds. It makes the message of Elijah and the outcome all of that more legendary because here we're talking about it and reading about it almost 3,000 years later. When God decides to do something, he oftentimes wants to make the, the impression last. Each team had its own play-by-play -play strategy for victory. The followers of Baal had their pagan strategies, uh, call prayers to, to Baal, cut themselves, let the blood go everywhere. Elijah had his, trash-talking and humiliating the pagans and then do exactly what God had told him to do, even if it appeared to everyone else to be foolish. You realize that we as Christians look like idiots to a lot of our secular friends? and family members. Why do you get up and go to church on Sunday mornings? Why do you want to sit through Bible study? Why do you want to go to worship? Wait, you can go back on Wednesday nights? Have you? Do you not have a life? And then you can tell me that even on your, home, on your own at home, you sit and read the Bible, that worthless book of myths and legends. Have you lost your mind? That's what they think. They think we're foolish. But we haven't finished reading the end of the story. There's one more verse, verse 40. Then Elijah commanded them, meaning the people there, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered the people. So the story ends with the bloody execution of 400 priests of Baal. Let me wrap this up now by sharing just a few what I y'all know I call life lessons from this passage. Number one, the account that we've just read here is ultimately should be viewed as a battle between God and paganism, between the forces of good and the forces of evil, uh, between what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong. And that's a life lesson for you and I in that today, the uh, United States has fewer Christians than ever in its history, probably. Uh, we may have people who call themselves Christians, but when you look at their practice and their doctrine, they're doing and believing some really strange things that I don't believe the Bible teaches. Or they're Christians in name only, and they, they never go to church. They don't, do, they don't do anything to really identify themselves as Christians. Number two, 
life lesson. It's also about being courageous in the face of fear and what appears to be visibly overwhelming. It's, it's human to fear when you're in the face of overwhelming opposition. But this lesson is designed to teach us that if you are standing on God's word, on God's teachings, and God's principles, no number of people can overwhelm you and me. We will stand. God will prove himself faithful. Now, do some Christians die when they stand for God? Yeah. Our church history is full of people who died for their, their faith. And you've heard me tell stories of people around the world today who are dying for their faith. That, and that's my third principle. The Bible and Christian history are packed full of examples of a single individual or a small handful of faithful believers who took a stand for God's teachings and truth. Beginning with Peter, who gave a very gutsy sermon on the day of Pentecost. The Pente day of Pentecost, Pente is Greek for 50. 50 days after the, uh, the, the Hebrew celebration of Passover, 50 days basically since Jesus was executed on a cross, Peter is standing in front of a crowd 50 days later and preached what is the most powerful, most well-known sermon in Christian history. He had 3,000 converts in one day. He did that knowing that at any point during the time he was preaching or afterwards, a Roman guard could have come and arrested him. He knew that any time during the preaching or after, the crowd could have just rushed him, thrown him over a wall and stoned him to death. But he was faithful. He did what God called him to do. Later, in 1517, a guy named Martin Luther, a Catholic theologian, started what we call the Protestant Reformation. Uh, he had a cash bounty on his head uh, by the Catholic Pope, and he lived the last 30 years of his life as an outlaw. If anybody had kidnapped him, dragged him to Rome, where they could put him on trial and burn him at the stake, they would have been given a huge cash reward. But God protected him. Uh, later, during World War II, a German Lutheran pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer was involved in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. He struggled with that. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be asked to help kill anybody as evil as he is. And he struggled. He wrote about all this. And we have his writings today, how deeply he struggled. But in the end, when time came to take a stand, he said, yes, I will work with these people because Hitler is demonic. He's beyond evil. He's the most evil human being any of us has ever been involved with in our lifetime. The plot failed. Bonhoeffer was arrested and jailed for over a year, and then he was hanged just three weeks before the war ended. But as you and I have, as you have heard me say repeatedly uh, from this pulpit and Bible studies, there are millions of Christians today who risk their lives being publicly known as a Christian. Whether they're in communist countries, Arabic or Muslim countries, or Hindu countries, they get rounded up, jailed, and killed every day. And they live under this severe human uh, mispersecution. Well, let me close up by, by sharing one thing with you. And today in America, we have a rapidly growing hatred of conservative Christians and anyone who stands for tra traditional moral values. There are strong forces at work in our nation and our society who are working to silence you and silence me because we speak out against their agenda. Their agenda is anti-Christian. Their agenda is against traditional moral values, and they want us to shut up and obey them. And this is how I'm going to close. This week, this past week, in Washington, D.C., there was a congressional hearing, and they brought two former FBI agents to testify. One of them was a former FBI agent named Nicole Parker, and the other was a former FBI agent named Kyle Serafin. The reason they're, they're former is that they became whistleblowers. They said, we can't, we can't take anymore what we're being asked to do. 
And it's saying, and in the testament, they basically said the vast majority of people who work for the FBI and the Justice Department, the lower levels down, they're as committed as they ever were to what the FBI and the Justice Department used to be about. But our top leadership have been giving us commands and directives that we just can't follow anymore. It's wrong. It's illegal. It's unconstitutional. Now, let me tell you one of the, the specific things they talked about. The, uh, the FBI and the Justice Department employees uh, have been told to go after ra uh, traditional Catholics, uh, con traditional conservative Baptists, that word Baptist was actually used, and traditional cons other conservative evangelical groups because they are, we are resistant to uh, what the, the left wing of the Democrat Party wants to do. Uh, he said there is a document circulating within those two departments. If, you, if somebody uh, publicly proclaims themselves to be against abortion or they are opposed to the LB, LGBTQ agenda, they are, to, they are, and, they're, and they're, they're resistant to our way of changing America, being pushed. If they, if they indicate they're opposed to this, we're pushing this stuff down the throats of all Americans, get them out of here. So rather than do that, they resign. Now, I don't know how much money an FBI agent makes. I guarantee it was more than I made as an employee of the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board. But look what they, these people, and they said there's more like us. They're giving up their how many years they've been working, uh, their, their, their tenure, their, their insurance, their retirement, their reputations. It'll never be hired, be able to get hired as long as these people are in power again. But they said, what is going on is wrong, and I'm, we're willing to sacrifice our careers and our beliefs. I mean, not our beliefs, but live out our beliefs. Uh, we don't care what the cost is. The spiritual Super Bowl will continue long after the game ends tonight. You and I will be called on at some point to take a stand. So once again, and I got this information off foxnews.com, which I recommend all of you go on 